No. Nope. Mm -mm. This is gonna trigger some people. But hey, don't shoot the messenger. These are the top five worst JDM engines, according to you, with an honorable mention for one that's not actually that bad, but I personally can't stand it. Japanese engines are literally known for reliability, and some of them are known for making huge power. Go check out the launch control videos we've done on the RV26 and the 2JZ right up here. Today, we're taking a good hard look at some of the Japanese engines that just don't make the cut. And honestly, you'd probably be better off just avoiding altogether. If you own any of these, I'm sorry in advance because some of this is going to be hard to hear. Let's get into it. We're kicking... We're kicking this one off with the obvious choice. We just ran a few polls on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram asking all of you which JDM engines you thought were the worst. And by a landslide, the 1.3 liter Renesis Rotary led the pack. Here's the thing. Rotary engines are awesome when it comes to motorsport. They're super compact, ultra lightweight, and rev to the moon, making them a ton of fun to wind out out on the racetrack. <laughs> They just don't work that well in a streetcar. They don't make any low-end torque. They aren't economical or very efficient, and exhaust emissions are a constant cause for concern, largely because by design, they have to ingest a relatively large amount of engine oil to keep the friction surfaces of the apex seals well lubricated. Right around a full quart of oil gets consumed in just a thousand miles, or even more if you drive it hard. And seeing as the oil sump holds only four and a half quarts or so, you can expect to burn through the entire engine's capacity between oil changes. But the coveted 13B and several other older rotaries burn oil too. So just what makes the Renesis so bad? For starters, in an effort to make the thing meet emission standards, they change the way it breathes. The exhaust port design forces exhaust gases to have to make a couple abrupt, sharp turns, which essentially makes the poor thing choke itself. Then there's the startability problem. The starter motor itself was too underpowered from the factory, and on a hot start without the upgraded starter, the thing would literally flood itself. Coil pack failure was extremely common. They used much narrower apex seals that wear out prematurely. And according to some reputable rotary builders, the internal tolerances from the factory are sloppy at best, erring on the side of being downright poorly made. The Renesis engine's rotor housing is nowhere near as strong as the older 13Bs. They wear down prematurely and allow compression to bypass into the exhaust port which not only robs you of power, but sends your oil consumption numbers through the roof. Because of all of the above, they don't take boost well either. So there's no affordable way to increase power. Lastly, when the thing wears out, and it's not an if, but a when, the average cost to rebuild it ranges from six to $8,000, partly because you'll almost always need new rotor housings. I've done a couple. An $8,000 rebuild on a $10,000 car? <laughs> no thanks. Okay, <laughs> hold on here. Not all Subaru EJ engines are bad. There are over 20 variants. The EJ207, for instance, is an absolute rock star. <laughs> Subaru's EJ series of engines are horizontally opposed boxer fours. And real quick, not every flat engine is a boxer, but all boxers are flat engines, okay? Flat engines are cool because one, they're pretty compact, and two, they're short and fat instead of tall and skinny. And that means the weight of the engine is down as low as possible, which obviously is great for handling. However, there are a few caveats. They burn oil because of the oil control rings that sludge up and stick. Both pistons and connecting rods are known to crack. I've personally seen five different Subarus in my career spin rod bearings. Not a great track record as I fix German cars. And oh yeah, the head gaskets. Subaru has never officially recalled or even released a bulletin regarding the head gaskets on any model. However, personal experience aside, a quick Google search will net you all the information you need. 
Head gasket failure is a real thing, especially on the EJ25 naturally aspirated engines, but it's a problem that plagues them all. Now, before you fire up your hate fingers in the comments, I know, I know, your mom has a Forester that has 200,000 miles and it's never had a problem. And your dad's old legacy is still kicking around just fine. But honestly, it's partially luck of the draw and mostly how it's been cared for. The engines themselves aren't bad when they're taken care of, but I'm here to tell you, they just aren't very tough until properly built. They just don't hold up to the abuse quite as well as many other JDM powertrains. And the factory engine controllers are pretty dumb and don't do a great job at controlling spark timing to eliminate knock, especially on the turbocharged models. There are fixes for every single one of their shortcomings, but none of them come cheap. And seeing as it's a boxer, the engine will be coming out of the car for any internal repairs. Personally, I'd kill to have a 22B, shortcomings included. I've got nothing against Subaru, but hey, the numbers don't lie. Flame suit engaged. Okay, so truth is, this engine isn't so bad. It came in a lot of cars, and the turbocharged version can be found in one of my favorites, the Mitsubishi 3000 GT. But there are a few known issues that knock it down a few pegs against other similar Japanese units. Firstly, the lifter tick problem. Now, lifter tick alone, while certainly super annoying, isn't actually gonna hurt anything. See, all that happens in these engines anyway, is the tiny little oil hole in the lifter itself gums up with sludge and carbon and prevents the lifter from adequately cushioning the impact from the rocker arm. Mitsubishi fixed the problem within just a few years by building lifters that have a much larger, roughly three millimeter hole to prevent the problem from happening. There's even a special tool so the lifters can be replaced without having to remove the timing belt and camshafts. That timing belt though, that's kind of a bear to replace. In fact, doing any repair on this engine is sort of a huge pain in the ass. And that's truthfully the biggest reason it's on this list at all. It's got miles of vacuum lines that are now all falling apart. And even though it is a three liter V6, its physical size seems much larger especially since it's almost exclusively found in transverse platforms. By no means the worst engine on the list, but one I'd probably personally just avoid. Like the last engine on this list, this is an engine that's actually pretty good. The problems start with everything that's attached to it. Just look at this vacuum diagram and tell me that looks fun to work on. No, 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 no. Now, vacuum lines themselves are no big deal to replace. The problem is that the engine control module software fitted to all these was pre-OBD2. That means diagnosing drivability problems can get really difficult really fast. And you're gonna have some. There are hoses and valves and solenoids and pipes everywhere. And when one of them goes wrong, well, the car just stops running right, and the car's onboard computer isn't gonna be much help in tracking the problem down. <laughs> to add to all that, this thing is a nightmare to work on. There are so many little brackets and clips and bracketed clips that have to go together in just the right order. <sighs> and, and that's coming from me, a guy who likes working on Audis. See, most manufacturers weren't brave enough to play with twin turbos yet. It was still early days for the tech, so every car maker kind of just figured it out. And some of them figured it out a little quicker than others. I love me a 300ZX. But they're complicated, cramped, and parts are more expensive than some of the alternatives. So far, every engine on this list is one that can be found in a performance car. So let's dial it back a bit and take a look at one that's designed to be simple and reliable and efficient, but not particularly powerful. And it doesn't even excel at that. We're talking the big Ultima Energy QR25DE. It's a two and a half liter inline four that makes around 175 horsepower. It's made out of aluminum and all of them have double overhead cams that's about where the good news stops. For 
starters, and it's kind of a funny one, unless you own one of these, Nissan fitted these engines with not one, but two catalytic converters. That's nothing new. In fact, it's pretty standard these days. The whole point of fitting more than one cat to an engine like this is obviously for emissions. Engineers figured out that by getting the catalytic converter as close to the combustion chamber as possible, helped light the cats off sooner and got the car running as clean as possible, as soon as possible. Except Nissan made one tiny little error in their calculations. See, putting a catalyst inside the exhaust manifold has its pros, but it had one big unforeseen con. The cat would break up over time, and because by design, the engine pulls a small amount of exhaust gases back into the combustion chamber after each exhaust stroke, that meant parts of the catalytic converter got sucked in right along with it. Guys, that's bits of metal in the combustion chamber. That's not good. Then there's the little issue of the screws that hold the butterfly valve to the control rod inside the variable geometry intake manifold backing out. And again, feeding the engine a healthy dose of chunks of metal. They leak oil, and last but not least, timing chain failure has been reported. Normally it starts with a loud rattling sound on startup, and eventually the chains wear to a point where they just jump teeth. Valves hit pistons, and for all intents and purposes, the engine is done for. Nissan has made a ton of great engines over the years. This just ain't one of them. Ah, the 54B. This is the mechanical equivalent of cyberpunk for our generation. What looked so promising on paper was just a total letdown once it was in the hands of gamers. Tuners, I mean tuners. It's not that the 54B is an unreliable engine or hard to work on or leaked like a sieve or anything like that. No, the problem is for a factory turbocharged engine of this size, performance is just downright underwhelming. And there's not a lot you can do without spending huge money to get it stepped up. Even though it's the first Japanese production engine with digital fuel injection and turbocharging, it looked a lot to be desired. Instead of using a proper multi-port injection setup, they opted for throttle body injection, just like you got on a Chevy pickup of the time. This particular throttle body injection system resulted in fuel distribution that's sketchy at best. Not a great feature when coupled with boost pressure and aggressive ignition timing. Single overhead camshafts meant there was nothing you could do about tuning valve train overlap. And worst of all, when pushed much harder than the 150-ish horsepower it made when stock, the cylinder head would warp. If you ever dreamed of owning a Starion, just know that this is what you're up against. Look, this engine has one major common problem, the head gaskets. They commonly fail, and it's not the easiest job in the world to get done. But that's not why it made the list. I personally just cannot stand the way anything I've ever driven with one of these between its fenders drives. In my opinion, and hey, I'm just some dude on the internet, so if you've got one and you love it, more power to you. It doesn't make enough low-end torque, and it doesn't like to rev, so the horsepower it does make isn't super available. I don't think it sounds particularly good, and I don't like working on them. They aren't that efficient. It's just not my thing. But I have to stress that this engine powers some of the world's most favorite Yodas, and besides the head gasket problem, it's actually very reliable. I just personally can't stand it. That's my hot take for the day. I'm sure we're gonna get flamed for this video, but it is what it is. If you guys wanna see more videos like this, like maybe worst German engines or worst American engines or French engines, I don't know, let me know down in the comments below. Go check out some other idealist videos we've done right over here, or go watch whatever YouTube thinks is best for you right over here. This is Trav, this is Idealist, and you're watching Ideal Media. Thanks for sticking around to the end, guys, and we'll see you all next time.